Blog Talk Radio. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. And I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see aspiring to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without Above and below, yeah East, west, north and south I sense your presence Without and within Below and above, yeah, yeah East, west, north and south I sense your presence I sense your presence I 
shepherd, shalom, holy angel of the Most High. O shepherd, shalom, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. All right. Welcome and thank you for joining me tonight on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols George, and I am your host tonight. The music you heard at the beginning of the show is I Sense Your Presence by Shemshai. Welcome back to those that are returning after our last couple of weeks here, and welcome to those that are just joining us for the first time here. I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday lives. I created the Genesis Clearing Statement, which some of you may have experienced a few weeks ago on Kevin's show, Walking on the Sidewalk and also on last week's show, which if you missed that, you can catch it in our archives um, here on Main Street Universe. I have authored two books titled Activating Compassion and Activating Compassion, the Workbook. In addition, I have created the Compassion Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, seminars, um, book signings, and fundraising events. And you can check out more about what is happening with the Compassion Tour at www.jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. And that will show you all of the events that are currently available to register for. And you'll also see in there that there's an option called Gifting the Tour. And that's for people that are unable to attend any of the events, but they want to still support the work that I'm doing. And you can actually gift any amount that you want. And there's there's actually choices in there. I give you a little something back if you're doing some gifting. So you can check that out if you'd like. And here at Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, what we're doing is I look at different ways that compassion exists in our lives and how to remove our blocks, resistances, frustrations, and more. Some weeks I'm discussing different aspects of how compassion is in and affects our life and the different areas of compassion. Some weeks I'm going to be doing more exercises and practical implementations on the air. Um, Many times I'm going to have guests on the show so that you can learn about their work and how other things complement and work with compassion. I will be highlighting different musical artists along the way, and I'll also have nights that are just going to be focused on um, you as guests where you can call in and share what's happening in your life These will be kind of like coaching nights, and I'll work with you live on the air to help you get through things, make breakthroughs, and answer questions that you have. Um, And and just keep in mind, when you share your experiences, you're also helping others that are dealing with the same or similar situations in their life. So it's really useful when you do that. Um, If you're you're calling in tonight, I I see some people showing up in the queue here, and there are going to be opportunities uh, to ask questions with our guests and things tonight as well. And I'll be watching the the chat there in case somebody has a question that they want to put into the chat. Uh, To let you know, on tonight's show, I'm going to be talking with Mary Beth Labar and Donna Morin. I will be taking some live callers, as I mentioned, um, for those of you that have questions for these guests. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask our guests, you can press 1 if you're already in our phone queue, or you can, um, like I said, type it in, or if you're not on the phone line set, you can call in and then press 1. The number's right at the the top where you're logged in there Um, with that. So both of our guests are actually working with me on the Compassion Tour stop that's titled opening the door to you, and this stop on the tour is in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and you can find out more about this particular stop at www.compassiontourattleboro.eventbrite.com, and um, Mary Beth has actually been really nice. She's offered up her space for us to use um, as this for this particular venue, and it is a full weekend intensive workshop that we're going to be doing together. So we're talking like super mega transformations at this weekend event, and and it has a special emphasis on getting in touch with the inner you and how to create more of the you that you want to be. So we're doing a lot of focusing on on you during that workshop. 
Um, just a reminder that if you enjoy this show, make certain that you tell your friends, family, significant others, uh, Facebook connections, and anybody else that you feel inspired to share it with. And they can always call um, in and listen to it, or not call in, but they can always listen to it in the archives. So they just use the same link that you use to get into the show and can listen to it at their convenience. They can also go on to my Activating Compassion page, which is at uh, facebook.com forward slash Activating Compassion, and uh, just click on the notes file. I I keep all of my archived shows, um, the links for them in there, so that's really useful as well. Now, before we get started on everything, we're going to... Um, open up to see what name of God is lending energy to our show tonight. And what we're doing here is I'm randomly opening to a page in the book of uh, the 72 Names of God by Yehuda Berg. And I like his work, as I've mentioned in the past, just because it's kind of the way I like to deal with things or explain things. It's very um, life-focused and it's very practically focused. And I use this book frequently when I'm looking for a little insight or to get me through something in my life. And so I'm just going to open this up and see what message we have here tonight and um, see what we have going on. And what I see here is I'm seeing we've got tonight, our message is defying gravity. And that's the connection we're making tonight. What it says here is it says our true destiny is control of all reality through the force of our imagination with the power of our thoughts guided by the light within our souls. How do we manifest this destiny? Everyone fantasizes about having the power of mind over matter, but according to Kabbalah, we already possess it and we use it every day without even realizing it. Here's the problem. 99% of our thoughts and consciousness are controlled by ego. Thus, our negative thinking influences physical reality in a detrimental way. All the troubles of the world, disease, earthquakes, famines, crime, the concealment of God's light, the lack of belief in the reality of the human soul, it's all the result of our negative self-centered consciousness. We created this reality, we create this reality every moment. Pessimism, doubts, and cynicism becoming self-fulfilling prophecies. More ironic is the fact that our innate ability of mind over matter is hidden from us only because we don't believe it to be true. If we allow ego desires to guide our existence, we're forever imprisoned and ruled by physical matter. There's only so far that we can go, and it isn't very far at all. We need to see beyond illusions. We need to unmask the players in the masquerade. If we allow the authentic yearnings of our souls to be our prime motivating force in life, as opposed to the illusory temptations of the material world, mind over matter will become our new reality. So how do we accomplish this? By continually rejecting self-centered behavior, we gain the ability for mind to absolutely control the material world in a purely positive constructive and miraculous manner. And the the meditation that goes with this is you unleash the power of mind over matter, the soul over the ego, and the spiritual over the physical. The goal is not to renounce the physical world, but to eliminate its control over you and to become the true captain of your own fate. Everything becomes possible. Now, I find this really interesting that we got this particular message tonight, <laughs> given the guests that we, we have on, and um, and I think you're going to see how that applies even so much more. And, and as it says here, the key is not that we're forgoing everything for ourselves, because it is very, very important for us to be compassionate with ourselves and to take care of ourselves. If we don't do that, then it makes it very difficult for us to be compassionate or to be available for other people um, fully and completely as as we need to be able to do. And so I I find that a very interesting concept that we've come up with, and and that key comes back to it's fine to enjoy the physical and the material world. We just don't want it to be controlling us, and and that becomes the real, real key in this situation. So um, anyways, 
moving on here, our first guest tonight is Mary Beth Labar. And when I'm thinking of, of questions that apply to Mary Beth's work, a um, couple things that come to mind for me are, uh, what if you could set your brain to help you? Have you ever wanted to quiet the fears in your mind? Have you ever wanted to get your mind to work for you? Now, Mary Beth Lamar is a L-I-S-C-W, and I, I'm going to give her the chance to explain what that means because <laughs> we get a lot of these certifications that are abbreviated and, and, um, and we don't always know exactly what those stand for. And certified hypnothera hypnotherapist, she has found a way to increase the be benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy and bring faster results through the addition of hypnotherapy. She has developed techniques to invoke the imagination while allowing the limbic brain to rest. Mary Beth's work brings endless possibilities. Hypnosis creates a pathway to the unconscious and to our imagination without the interference of the critical mind. In a way, hypnosis is just a tool that removes the obstacles from the road you choose to follow. I believe, um, or she believes, that all dreams are our personal guides to a successful future. Um, her seminars are designed to move you from the dream to the reality. And you can learn more about Mary Beth Labar's work and um, what she's doing on her website, which is www.therapeuticmindesign.com. Dot com. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Mary Beth on the air here. And Mary Beth, I just want to thank you so much for being here tonight on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Well, you are welcome. I'm happy to be here. Great. I know it's kind of a little bit late where you are, so. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Just a little bit. And I'm going to let you just kind of start by sharing with us, you know, what those credentials are or those letters all stand for okay. and tell us about you and, and how you got to where you are today. I'd love to. Um, LICSW is a licensed independent clinical social worker, so I do have a private practice in North Attleboro. And, of course, certified hypnotherapist, I think, stands for itself. I am a certified hypnotherapist, um, and I integrate hypnosis into my cognitive behavioral therapy practice. I'm moving much more into the hypnosis, and based on what you were talking about earlier and what you were reading when you were talking about the ego, and what I thought of is the iceberg theory. And the iceberg theory is how only 10% of us or 10% of our brain is actually conscious of 100% of what's going on. And 90% is underwater and is unconscious, which is literally our unconscious mind. So, so much of what we are responding to is the ego, which is the 10% above water, and what we can see. And so what I do with my clients is I help them to bypass the critical mind, which is the mind that is always talking to itself, you know, the mind that is always finding reasons or excuses to not do the things that we really want to do so that we put ourselves into these positions where we want something and then we talk ourselves right out of it. So what the hypnosis does is it, bypasses that critical mind that's constantly yakking at us and it taps into that 90% that's underwater of the unconscious. And as I'm in that state where my critical mind is asleep, my limbic system is asleep, so I'm not responding with fight, flight, or freeze, other things can come up for me. And as I'm in hypnosis, I can give suggestions to myself if I'm in self-hypnosis or as the hypnotist, I can give suggestions to the person that will move them to their goal rather than move them away from their goal. So it's really the power of thought. What I like to say is that what you think about comes about. So, so often our thoughts are very critical, they're very negative, and so we are manifesting those negative thoughts. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I do. 
and it happens very rapidly, very quickly, and transformation occurs very fast. Yeah, and and I think I think this is really great that you've learned how to um, get to this point because I think it's it's a challenge for so many people, especially in a, a society today where it's all about get me there yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and it's. <laughs> You know, I, I've seen that that parallel. I've, I've seen it come through Facebook. I don't know how many times these days of the little tip of the iceberg on top of the water, and then mm-hmm. the big piece exactly. underneath the water. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and that's the, that's the picture I have in my mind when you're talking mm-hmm. about that. That's exactly and, it. Mm-hmm. And, and and I think it's yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I think it's so interesting where you're you're coming around with that aspect of. Of bringing up the point where we tend to block ourselves, uh, mm-hmm. we start out on something and then, and then we don't quite get there. We never get there, right? Often we never get there because we talk we talk ourselves right out of it because it's fear and it's the ego that is afraid of failure, the ego that is afraid to be seen as less than, the ego that is afraid about how the person is going to be perceived. And so we stop. We stop doing the things that would really help us to fly. So it's part of what you were talking about is having compassion. And when I'm in a mode of ego, it is very fear-based, it's very comparison-based, it's very envy-based, it's anger-based. So I'm always looking outside of myself, comparing myself, and trying to figure out how I'm being perceived by others, which is always interfering with action. And so I'm always in my head, or we are always in our head, chatting and talking ourselves out of things, and we never get to that action state. So hypnosis moves us right into that action state very rapidly and very quickly. Yeah, and that that is such a powerful thing. Um, I, I I love that you brought up the fact that we get we we flip very easily and get focused on what somebody else is thinking mm-hmm. instead of getting back to us. And and we tend to live in a society where we're very um, concerned about what other people are thinking. And and this is where I know in some of the work I do with judgments and stuff that uh, one of the things I bring up in my book too is is 90% of our thoughts aren't our own thoughts. They're somebody else's thoughts. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and we get there and and so when we make the shift away from self, it's it's another way that we disconnect from spirit or source mm-hmm. and and as we do that, then, of course, our vibration lowers. We get into fear. We get into right. these spaces. We create these blocks. And um, so, so it's such a fascinating process, <laughs> I think. Right. And, 90, and actually, 90% of what we're thinking isn't really even what other people are thinking. It's what we think they're thinking. So it's even the <laughs> You know, it's really what we think they're thinking. And so we spend a lot of our energy in an area that is extremely negative instead of moving us to that area where we can get into the groove, really be who we were meant to be, and move forward so that, as you mentioned, our energy starts to vibrate at a higher level so that we have more energy and we can experience other people on a different level rather than trying to figure out what they're thinking. And and this is this is interesting. This is one of those things that as we raise our vibrations up um and and we we stop thinking about other people I I've, I've experienced anyways that a lot of the chatter goes down in my head. Yeah. And I I don't I've got a lot more clarity as I allow mm-hmm. myself to in that positive space, that that space that's thinking, I can do this, I can pull this together, mm-hmm. um, these different things. 
I can bring these people together. As long as mm-hmm. I'm staying there, my mind seems very clear, and it becomes easier right. and easier easier for me to do things. But what I'm really worried about, uh, you know, what somebody else is might thinking, or, or a lot of people, I would say, they get that thought in their head like, that person hates me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and th- that may have nothing to do with the truth whatsoever. That person may not hate them at all, <laughs> but they've got most that thought. Of time, most of the time it's not true. Unfortunately, perception is reality. So even if our perception is completely inaccurate, it does become our reality. And so right. a lot of what I do with the cognitive behavioral therapy is I look at what is a distorted belief that is driving that person. And I can give you an example. Um, I saw a young woman the other day who was grieving. And so she came to me and wanted me to help her with her grief. And she had lost her husband three years ago. And she's still grieving. So she couldn't really define for me what it was that was allowing her to continue to hold on to that grief. But the interesting thing was, and she wasn't connecting it, she was also complaining about having neuropathy in her hands and neuropathy in her mouth. And so she wasn't connecting the two. But under hypnosis, what came out was that she was terrified that if she did not mourn her husband, that she would be considered an evil person who never really loved him. Mm. And she could never verbalize how she really felt. She could never say, I want to stop grieving because it created so much guilt and shame in her. And so the neuropathy in the mouth. And she could never release her husband. She was holding on to these memories and she was holding on to this lifestyle. And she also had a 12-year-old son and he was still grieving. So they were literally holding on to this past and not wanting to let it go. And so now we're working on helping her to relieve that past, to let the grieving go, to keep the good memories. And as she lets go of the past and as she begins to verbalize things, the neuropathy will go away. Mm. It's yeah, and, and, powerful. And, and that's really interesting, too. I'm glad you brought that up because um, I notice so many times working with people in the spiritual issues, emotional issues, mental issues going on, and that they're trying to work past, and it will manifest in mm-hmm. an area of the body that is directly related to the fear or the challenge. In this case Absolutely. that you mentioned was this woman's mouth where she was afraid to mm-hmm. speak. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people will get things in their their knees or their hips, um, which which represent oftentimes that they don't feel supported mm-hmm. or that they stand on their own. Um, mm-hmm. Or they'll they'll get pains in their their shoulder region and that will tighten up and and oftentimes that might be related to carrying too much burden or responsibility mm-hmm. or taking on more than what's theirs. Um, so it is really interesting, I think. And and they've been showing more and more of this where people will go in and they're like, I've got this pain and I've got this going mm-hmm. on and and there's nothing wrong. The doctors will right. run every test and there's nothing showing up in the test and. And when this is happening, that's when we really need to look to these techniques like hypnosis and we need to look right. to what's going on in the brain and the head and the thoughts um, because that is creating these different things. And that's how we can actually separate whether something is physical or mental, emotional, spiritual. Right. And anything that we are struggling with or having conflict with or having pain around emotionally will sooner or later manifest in our bodies. It's just a matter of time. And what hypnosis also does is it's kind of twofold because in terms of pain, I can relieve someone's pain in one session if there's nothing that's, you know, physiologically wrong with them. Even if there is something physiologically wrong, I've worked a lot with migraines, and I can relieve a migraine through hypnosis. But The other piece of that is that once I've relieved the pain, if I allow the client or ask the client to get back up into their head, up into that critical mind, and allow the limbic system to connect again, the pain comes back. 
And all I have to do is ask them to go back into the body, to get out of the brain, to get out of the limbic system, and the pain goes away. So they're really able to see very clearly that their thoughts are so directing what's happening in their body. Because we tend to think that we can solve a problem with our head. But really, emotions don't live in our head. Emotions live in our bodies. And I think that as a society, we've forgotten that. So if we can just move ourselves down into the body and pay attention to what's happening in the body, we'll get information that we'll never get from our brain. Yes. I I, I see that, and and I've experienced that many times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, myself, where... It, it, that's exactly how I knew mm-hmm. what to point with somebody or when I've done energy work on people in the past, clearing chakras and things. And and it um, definitely, you know, it hits these mm-hmm. different areas of the body. And they'll they'll mm-hmm. say to me, I've got, got this thing going on here and I don't know what it's mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and stuff. And it's yeah. interesting because the, the aspect that you work with, with some of these distorted thoughts, and yeah. what you refer to on your website as fictitious fears, um, right. it relates directly with a lot of my concepts on judgments um, mm-hmm. not being ours. And and so, you know, that's, that's interesting. I'm so glad that you're doing this work where you are mm-hmm. placing such a huge emphasis on fears and, um, you know, how to work past that and, and showing work people past. that direct connection because a lot of times people don't don't understand that direct connection there. Right. One of my very favorite sayings is energy flows where attention goes. And so if I'm paying attention to something negative, all of my energy goes there. And what I focus on, I get more of. It's kind of what you think about comes about. You know? And so our thoughts are extremely powerful The words that we choose to use are extremely powerful, especially as parents talking to our children, because they make an imprint on our unconscious. And so we have to be really, I think, more conscientious about the words that we use, not just to our children, but to everyone, and especially to ourselves, and that's the compassionate side. Yeah, and 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 this also fits in with some of the other other philosophies of um, law of attraction as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and, you know, it's a big thing, and and I think when people are looking at going on to their path or their journey, and particularly those people who have a message that they want to bring out or or things like this, and they start and they wonder, I wonder why this isn't working. I don't get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and a lot of times, just like I said, there's hidden judgments in there, and you use use these other terms, that, that they're lying in there, and we have to peel them away sometimes in layers because mm-hmm. sometimes we can't see all of those fears until we start to delve into them. Right, and hypnosis can get to them very rapidly because you've removed some layers and you've removed layers that take up a great deal of energy. So now you have energy that is paid attention to in a very different way and in an emotional way. And often what will happen is I will ask a client where they're feeling an emotion in their body. And everybody has different places. I had someone just this week say, I feel it in my eyes. Some people feel it in their chest. Some people feel it in their hips. And if they can go to that emotion, that emotion, if they will allow themselves to kind of just swim in it, that emotion has a great deal of information to give to them. But we tend to want to shove those emotions away and not look at them and not feel them. And really, it's the feeling and the looking at them that gives us freedom. So it's very powerful when someone is under hypnosis and they're dealing with these emotions and they're gaining insights that they never would have gotten if they tried to analyze it. So it's extremely powerful. 
and yes, this is this is a, a really important thing. I've got somebody in chat here, and they're they're asking okay. um, once you have hypnosis and the mm-hmm. emotion is discussed, does the issue in the body go away? And um, and this is kind of where you were talking. I want you to mm-hmm. respond here in a moment on this, where a lot of times, yes, it, once you pay attention to it, it's like it's just needing love. It's saying, I'm needing love. Mm-hmm. I'm needing attention. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have something wrong with me. It's like the little kid who mm-hmm. who doesn't feel well, and they can't quite express it yet, so all they know mm-hmm. to do is to scream. And until you mm-hmm. give that child the love that they need, <laughs> they keep screaming. Right. And very so often you, what you find in hypnosis is what's called the initial sensitizing event, which is the first time that that person experienced this thought, whether it's a thought of not being enough or whether it's a thought of, you know, not being smart enough or whatever it is. They can go back to that initial event when they were a child. And that's what's trying to get their attention. And now they can view it from the adult perspective and understand and gain new insight so they don't have to keep carrying that with them for the rest of their life. So very often someone will actually remember an event that happened to them when they were, say, seven years old. And if that happens to you at seven, then emotionally, if something similar triggers that emotion in you as an adult, you will go back to that seven-year-old. You'll be emotionally like that seven-year-old. That's why we have temper tantrums. That's why we're angry. <clears throat> That's why we isolate. And so now, as an adult, being able to almost re-witness that, you can re-nurture that child and you can kind of integrate it and understand it from an adult perspective rather than staying in that seven-year-old psyche. Yes, and, and I think... I think so many times we get that that initial trigger, as you say, when we're we're a child, and that's been my experience as well. That most of that programming comes very early in life. Very. Early. And for example, um, somebody might have been rejected by their father early uh-huh. in life, and then it kind of disappears, and they don't think about it for a long time, and then they get ready to go into dating, and uh-huh. all the they're trying to be that person that's pleasing their father again through their relationships. Yeah, there's that. And then there's also the trigger of rejection so that maybe an innocent statement could be made by someone she's on a date with like, gee, that's an interesting haircut, and you immediately begin to feel you're being rejected when that's not Mm -hmm. the intention of the person. So, so many things happen, but if you can really begin to understand the root of that and where its genesis was, then you begin to understand that you don't have to keep it. Mm -hmm. It's not relevant any longer. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to make those changes. So you're really freeing up energy. and, And that's where I know where I had created, for example, the Genesis Clearing Statement to help people with this going down to that very core point and uh-huh. I know one of the factors I bring in is is the first space you've got to come from is safety. If uh-huh. your if your essence, your soul is not feeling safe from something, then it, it's going to be almost impossible for it to progress. Right. And I think what's interesting is what you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about the ego and how the ego so gets in our way, because if we're being driven by ego only then we're extremely vulnerable to so many things, including the fear of being rejected or the fear of making a mistake. And if we're not acting out of our ego, if we're really acting based on this idea that we want to evolve and become the person that we were meant to be, then it's much more freeing. And we can forgive ourselves and we can be compassionate and we can make mistakes because we know we're growing through it all. So we're not very critical. Absolutely. And and Mary Beth, I've got a caller here on the line and mm-hmm. I'm going to bring them on and okay. give them a chance to ask a question if they've got one for you here, okay? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, and I'm bringing on caller. You're from 818 area code, I see. Um, can you hear us okay? Yes. Um, wow, Susan from California. I'm learning so much tonight, kind of making me feel, um, well, you, how can I explain this? Um, my ex-husband was extremely abusive to all of us. Mm-hmm. His nature was, I found out later, a sociopath, bipolar, whatever it was. And Mm -hmm. what we went through went into our subconscious and came out later. And my son Mm -hmm. gags and throws up. And Mm -hmm. um, he goes to a therapist, and when he mentioned to them about hypnosis, and she says, oh, no, no, that wouldn't work. But what you're saying tonight is that it's possible it can work. And he doesn't have to go to this therapist for a whole year. No. I offer packages and I can deal with anxiety for an example pretty severe anxiety with where they throw up in, that badly where they throw up where they throw up where they get stomach aches where they can't go to school especially in children and I can deal with that between 6 to 12 visits and in terms of school anxiety I can deal with school anxiety in under 6 visits and have mm-hmm the child going to school and feeling really good. So it's, I, you know, I was a traditional therapist for many, many years, and I found hypnosis by mistake. I was looking for a tool that would help me expedite and get my clients to where they wanted to go faster. And I was especially looking for that tool for my clients who were struggling with post-traumatic stress and anxiety. And I was looking for EMDR, which is an eye movement therapy. And hypnosis kept coming up. And so I thought, this is trying to get my attention. And so I paid attention. And I took the course, and it has transformed my way of doing therapy. Really? I'll tell you something. I also experienced something um, that people can use hypnosis or the tone of their voice for their own purposes. Yes. I was with a psychic Look vampire, up. and okay. he I didn't realize it, that every time I spoke to him, he quieted my mind. He got, I learned that that's good, and visual perception. But every time I spoke to him, I fell asleep. Mm-hmm. I got used to the tone of voice, and I lost my mm-hmm. freedom of will. It's very odd how this whole thing happened. Well, that's something different, because if you're asleep, you're not in hypnosis. But... Um, there oh. is something, yeah, if you're asleep, you are not in hypnosis, okay? And there is something called neuro-linguistic programming, which I use in my therapy. Um, it is a way of also treating people who have very deep-seated patterns and trying to move them out of those patterns. So you might want to look that up, too. So if you can uh-huh. find a hypnotist, who also does neuro-linguistic programming for your son, I think that you would be on the right track. It's called low, low what, what is it called? Neural. It's N-E-U-R, neuro, N-E-U-R-O. N-E-U-R-O, uh-huh. Linguistic, L-I-N-G, U-I-F. U-I-F. T-I-C. T-I-C. Programming. Okay. So what he NLP did... Was not hypnosis. I thought it was, and so I was kind of scared about him going through. That was something totally different that I. That was something totally different. Um, (sighs) We all, we can all be hypnotized. We hypnotize ourselves daily. First of all, twice a day, everyone goes into hypnosis right before they fall asleep and right before they wake up. That is a place where you are literally going into hypnosis. But once you fall asleep, you're no longer in hypnosis. And obviously, once you wake up, you're no longer in hypnosis. But we Ah. also, we are in hypnosis so often because if you think about our imagination, Uh all creation, everything that we create begins in our imagination. We can't have something manifest until it starts in our imagination. Uh So if I'm creating something, then... I have to believe that it's going to happen. And so if I'm creating something positive in my mind, that's all great. But I had his dreams, dreams too, which was so strange. I, um, He would speak to me at night. I wake up, I had his dreams. It was very 
odd how this all this thing happened. Now I have my own manifestations, but it was like I could I heard that voice and I had to do it. So I thought it must be I was not hypnotized, so it was something no. else. No, wow. and hypnosis, hypnosis is really, there is some controversy about this, but I believe that all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. Uh, when, uh, as a hypnotist, the subject is allowing me to guide them. They're trusting me to guide them. But oh, without you're their allowing. Permission, nothing can be done. Yes, they have to allow me to guide them. Oh, so Absolutely. someone that you're not knowing they're doing it, that's not it. But advertisers that's hypnotize people to buy products. That's absolutely. So some... they do. Advertising is yes, uh, they absolutely do. They entice you. It's more in, uh-huh. they more entice you to buy their product. Yes, they make you think uh... that you need it. So this is a vib- So hypnosis is not a vibration that you're picking up. That's that's no, another no. person. Ah, it was no, a vibration. No. Okay, no, tone of voice vibration. Thank you, and I'm going to look into that yeah. for him. So I feel better that it's not something awful, that it is something good that you can do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And, and, and sometimes we don't always know what that piece is that um, allows us or, or, or says okay to some of these mm-hmm. programmings, like with commercials or different things or, um, or, or in hypnosis, but we are always giving permission along the way and and I think that that's you know could be a whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah but you way. said compassion what drew me to your station when you said compassion and that music and today should Friday is that this new this other person that came in my life he gave me compassion and I thought he opened my heart. Now today someone told me that what I believe of this person that he's the darkness and all these things and it made me really uneasy. But what you said today about compassion to another he is that way, and I see him act to others. So now I'm be- beginning to believe, and I was so scared. I've been avoiding his phone call all night because what these people said, it's what your what you believe, what your belief system is, and what you believe what others tell you. They could bring out trust the fear in you. Too. Huh? Trust, trust your instincts too. Yes, well, and now I'm going to believe that. Well, okay, that makes it because t- he has compassion, and so. Yeah, a person that has compassion, how he acts to others, is, okay, I'm going to believe what I believe all along and not what the other people said to me because I was, I got such high vibrations, I spilled a bottle of water and I wasn't even near it, if you can understand that. So I thank you for the compassion tonight and the knowledge I picked up from you about hypnosis. And I'm I'm going to try to say to him, he's 23, let's give this a try, even though the therapist is telling him no. And and keep in mind, too, that when people are giving you all this different input, they're coming from their own experiences and their own um, viewpoints and perceptions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that person may not be that way with you at all. Like, they may be very compassionate with you, but somebody else might see something different because they've their experiences come from all this fear and lack of trusting people and... (gasps) That's Being every right. in big category, like all men are this way or all women are that way. Uh-huh. Or- well, I should realize this because this is what happened with my son. My ex-husband, if you can understand this, projected in us his his fear, his anxiety. Can you believe you can pick that up from someone? And these well, kids, it's energy. It's energy, and didn't know until mm-hmm. later on it came out. Mm-hmm. And so you have his choice. gagging is his thoughts in his head. So mm-hmm. I thank you, and I have to realize yeah. this is, I have to be careful not to take in what people say and just think of it and then question it and not just take it all into my own emotions to the point where I'm just out of control. I, okay. I find it's a way of balancing a little bit, Susan, as far as it's always great to have those other perceptions and viewpoints in case we might be missing something. But ultimately, mm-hmm. you've got to sit and see how that person is being with you, how they're treating other people, and how they're working over a period of time. That's what I've been observing with this person for the first time, and I saw how he treats everyone this way with compassion. And I said, oh, this person seems real, but tonight when these other people don't even know him, we're saying these things, I don't know, because they had psychic ability, I began to believe them, and then I got scared. Yeah. So. 
it's it's how you observe someone and thank you you did tell it's i am doing it correct this time okay i thank you so much what you just told me you do have compassion <laughs> okay thank and you thank again you. for the Good lesson night. thank you okay bye bye mary beth i have a question with somebody like this because sure. we have these people from all over um mm-hmm. Do you ever work with people over the phone or anything like that? I, or you know, um, I can work with people over the phone. It is much more difficult. Um, mm-hmm. Skyping is something that can be done, um, but there's nothing like face to face. Right. Nothing like face to face. So that that is certainly the way that I prefer to work, um, especially when you're doing things with neuro-linguistic programming where you're trying to break patterns and so observing it and being there in the moment is really important. Yeah, and and I agree with that. I always find the in-person because the the way the energies are are Mm -hmm. relating to each other is very, very valuable. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask that for somebody, say like Susan, and and maybe she wouldn't Mm -hmm. be able to see you in person. um, Right. She could okay, well, maybe 12 sessions with Mary Beth would would do it, even though if I was there in person, six <laughs> might work. Right. Um, well, sometimes what can happen is I all of the clients who I work with, when I do their first hypnosis session, I tape it, or I do a CD, and they take it home. And so their homework is to listen to that once or twice a day until they come back. Okay. And then we can so so if someone were to be seeing me on let's say once every month, you can then do it and then work in between. But you really do have to be seeing a person in in those interims, like at least the first time and maybe in the middle, you have to be seeing the person. Okay, and and this is this is good, and this this will. Transition. I have I have probably a couple of questions here. Um, over into some things. Um, is, let me ask first. Is there is there anybody that cannot be hypnotized or that this technique might not work for? Yes. Um, you have to have. Interestingly enough, the higher your IQ is, the more hypnotizable you are. And the reason for that is that. Highly intelligent people can use their imagination more vividly. And so the more vividly you can use your imagination, the more productive you're going to be using hypnosis. So if you have a very low IQ, you cannot be hypnotized. If you have attention problems where you're, you know, it's not necessarily ADHD because I have certainly used hypnosis on children with ADHD with great success. But if I have someone who is in a manic state, then I would never try to hypnotize that person. Okay? Because that can bring on more mania. I would also not try to hypnotize a person who has just experienced a trauma because I would not want to re-traumatize them. So these are things that are clinical. I wouldn't try to hypnotize someone who is schizophrenic. So there are certain people who you just don't want to hypnotize because it could trigger other things and re-traumatize. But other than those things that I've mentioned, everyone can be hypnotized. Children are very susceptible to it. And and part of that, I'm sure, is because their creativity and their imagination is so high. Yes. If one were younger. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it kind of gets... I want to say schooled out of us. <laughs> so um, we kind of lose that imagination. And for me, getting my clients back in touch with their imagination is the magic because that's where creation and that's where um, creativity comes and that's where your dreams come from. And so if you can get reconnected with your imagination, there's never a time when I'm working with someone, reconnecting them to their imagination, that they imagine something they can't do. So the Mm -hmm. imagination and our psyche and our abilities are very connected. 
Okay. So this is this is great, and I actually had somebody in the chat room, Casey, was mentioning, um, uh, you know, uh, thanks, Mary Beth, great information here. Um, I want to give you a few minutes. I mean, I can't believe where the time goes here, uh-huh. but um, I, I want to reinforce with, like, Susan or somebody else who um, uh-huh. would like to come and get some of these experiences with compassion and and with the work you do and, and Donna, who we'll be bringing on in the next part of the show here, um, that it's okay if you want to register children as well in this workshop it's okay you know oh, feel oh, like yeah. i i'm feeling like that's okay with me because there's nothing here that is going to be so called adult content and right. um and things you know just my only suggestion would be hopefully they're old enough that they can take in some of this and and that would be a way for somebody like her to come and and have some mm-hmm. personal experience um, right the same time and so and I do free screenings so no one you know everyone I see their initial visit is free so I do a free screening and in that screening I test the client for their suggestibility so I can measure using certain tests what degree of suggestibility they have and that's not a bad thing so when I say that you know I always tell my clients you have an amazing ability to take suggestions and manifest them but they're just not very good ones you know <laughs> let's try to make it good you know let's try to do this in a way that makes you feel good so um, one of the things I will be doing at your seminar is introducing everybody to some suggestibility testing so they see how powerful the imagination is. And so that we begin to understand that we limit ourselves significantly when we live in our head and that the body has so much more information to give us if we'll just allow ourselves to go there and to experience how the body is reacting and feeling So much of what I do when I'm working with a client, I had a parent today say to me, I feel like you've known my daughter forever. It's because I pay attention to body language. I don't so much pay attention to words. I pay attention to the body language. Mm -hmm. And that tells a huge story. But we kind of don't do that anymore. And and it is. That's such a huge and important um, thing, I feel, definitely um watching these little these little subtleties and it's part of how I work with people on teaching people how to be compassionate is watching that mm-hmm. that body mm-hmm. language and some of those mm-hmm. little hidden messages that might be there mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. we're we're kind of winding down on on the first part of the show here okay. so I want to give you the opportunity to share how people get in touch with you. I mean, it's fantastic. Okay. I don't even know of anybody who gives these free sort of consultations and, and uh, you know, checks you out to see if this is actually something that can work for you. That's amazing right. <laughs> work. And, right. again, Mary, yeah, I know you're in the North Attleboro area just outside right. of Massachusetts, which makes you very accessible to a lot of people on the East Coast. You know, I'm very um, close to Providence, too. I'm kind of in the center there. So, um, so yes, the way the, the best way how they get hold me. of you and uh, your website right. information, all that great stuff. Okay. So the company name is Therapeutic Mind Design. However, I will be changing that to North Attleboro Hypnosis, which is a whole lot easier. So um, someone pointed out to me that that is not a very good web page to have. I am going to be doing a new website, but for now that website, people can go to the www.therapeuticmindesign.com. And my the best way to get a hold of me is through this number. It's 508-954-2291. Again, 508-954-2291. Two two nine one, and then I do have a number that you can leave a message at. I usually do not get back to you. I'll usually get back to you within twenty four hours if you call on this line, and that is five zero eight three one six one six two zero. Again, it's five zero eight 
316-316-1620, and that is a line where you can leave a message. It is also my fax line if you wanted to fax something over to me. So those are the ways that you can contact me. Great. Well, uh, Mary Beth, I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your time and, and being here and joining in and answering some questions um, for our guest tonight. And I am going to move on here. We're going to be taking a short break. And when we come back, I will have Donna Morin with me, and she's going to be discussing her work as a certified health coach. In the meantime, I'm going to share some music with you by Shimshai, whose work is Roots, Reggae, and World Fusion. I first met Shimshai while studying some tantra work in Sedona, Arizona for a few years back, and they're growing, they're evolving, they're now doing nationwide tours, or not even nationwide, but they're performing all over the world, and this song is Great Mystery, and we'll be back in a few minutes.
Welcome back. And for those of you that are just tuning in, you are listening to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Uh, you were just listening to Great Mystery by Shemshai, a Roots Reggae and World Fusion Band. We just finished talking with Mary Beth Lavar. And if you missed the first part of our show, you can come back to the same link and listen to it in the archives. Um, also, you can go to www.facebook.com forward slash activating compassion. On my notes file there, I have all of the um, links for archived files that can be listened to. And uh, also on our Main Street Universe page on Facebook, um, you can find things there as well for listening to the to the archives. So lots of options for, for doing that. And now I'm going to be bringing on Donna Morin. Uh, she is the owner of Better Off Well. The questions that come to mind when I start thinking about Donna's work is, what if you had control over your health? Have you ever wanted to have the energy you did when you were younger? And would you like to feel better even with a busy schedule? Now, Donna Moore knows what it's like to not feel well. She's lived through severe asthma attacks, seasonal and food allergies, cervical cancer, weight gain, debilitating back pain. She understands how illness affects our moods, relationships, and our work performance. And through research and her own personal journey, Donna learned that we have control over our health. And science is now also validating and backing that genetic expression is influenced by our lifestyle habits. Uh, Donna Morin has a Master of Education. CHHC is an AADP, and I hope she's going to explain all of these. (laughs) I think one of them is a Certified Holistic Health Coach, if I'm right. And, uh, and yes, says here, certified health coach and founder of Better Off Well. She understands the demands particularly placed on women that make it difficult to feed a family within time and budget constraints. And she shares information about wellness through her, her monthly published wellness column, various parenting publications, and her own website. Donna has been interviewed for a number of New England radio stations. And if you'd like to find out more about Donna's work, she she has her website at www.betteroffwell.com. And I'm going to go ahead and bring Donna on here. Donna, welcome to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Hi, Jesse. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> I, I, I have to say I'm a little bit I'm a little bit um apprehensive about going after Mary Beth. She sounded so um she's so knowledgeable and I just I love I, I feel like I could listen to her all the time. And for her to sound so intelligent at midnight, I'm it's very impressive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well I mean it's it's amazing and I know you've been going all day here, so but what's exciting I think here is that She's talking about one aspect with hypnosis and the mind and the thoughts, and yet that also plays in with our wellness and our health and factors that are going on there because of the that uh, that whole emotional factor, those positive emotions or negative emotions, and and what's happening. But before we get too much into that, I, I'd love for people to know what your story is and um, what brought you into this field and and. What got you to where you are today? Sure, I'd love to share that. Um, and first of all, you had asked about my my letters, and you were right. Um, CHHC is Certified Holistic Health Coach, um, and the AADP part is um, an organization through which most health co- most health coaches are certified, and that's the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. So that's where that comes in. Um, but a little about my history. So my childhood was very much, um, very typical of what most Americans um, experience. I I grew up in a household with two working parents, uh, so I grew up largely on processed foods. Most of my um, food came from boxes and cans, uh, and I joke when I'm giving my presentations that I didn't even realize vegetables came from the ground for so many years. I thought they came from the can. Um, 
Spam was one of my favorite foods. Spam on Wonder Bread was my favorite lunch. And corned beef hash and dinty more beef stew were, were pretty much lunch every day for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, but I hadn't really considered the connection that this lifestyle had made for me personally until many years later, just a few years ago as I'm going through my health coaching training, I uh, started to make these connections and I started to think back to the fact that I did have very bad asthma and uh, nearly died a couple times because I didn't have my inhaler with me and was struggling for every single breath. Um, my allergies were so bad that there were times I just I couldn't even go outside and it kept me from doing a lot of the things that I really enjoyed doing. Um, and then later in my life, I, uh, I did develop cervical cancer when I was 30, and I had to have surgery twice to have that removed. And I had back pain um, that started one day when I was in the classroom. Actually, I sneezed and I threw my back out. And after that, I was just never the same. For years, I had to take really large um, pills every day, and um, I didn't know if I'd be getting out of bed and walking normally or not. Um, and I just kind of figured, you know, this was life. This was just how it was. Nobody knew who got cancer. It was, you know, bad luck or bad genes. Um, my bad back was must have been age because, you know, I was in my 30s after all. <laughs> so it happens when you're getting old, right? <laughs> um, but <laughs> then when I started going through my health coach training, I really started making the connection to the way I was living my life and my own health. And it was during that time that I really started taking steps toward moving myself away from processed foods, cleaning up my body. And not only that, but changing my lifestyle in terms of um, making more time for myself, um, changing the way I saw life, changing my whole perspective on life, practicing gratitude, um, those different things started happening for me and that it's really made a difference in my health. And, and I'm so excited today because um, my asthma is gone. I, know I have asthma no more. I haven't carried an inhaler now in eight years. Uh, no more back pain. Um, I, I'm doing things that I never thought I could do before. I just completed last weekend my second 5K this year. Um, I cycled in an event for two years in a row. It was 150 miles in two days. And those were things that, you know, a decade ago I never would have thought I could have done. And so I'm really passionate now about spreading the word and and letting people know that they do have control over their health because we are we really don't get that message so much in mainstream media. We've really become a society that turns very quickly to um to drugs. And my goal is to to go out now and show people that it, it that doesn't have to be the way. You don't have to be on a particular drug for the rest of your life. There are changes you can make that don't involve sacrifice and denial. It's just simply lifestyle changes that you make at your own pace that will help you to feel better and have more energy and lose those aches and pains that we think are as a result of aging. Yeah, and and this is such a good good thing that you're bringing up because I see a few different things in what you said. So many kids today are raised on fast food. They're raised mm -hmm. on um, a lot of processed foods, it, microwave foods. I mean, ever since microwaves became big, right? It's fast, it's quick, it's easy, toss it in the microwave. Um, and I think we are now starting to see a lot of those repercussions or a lot of those effects where we, we suddenly have kids with, say, like a lot of ADHD or or bipolar things going on or, or different things. And I know for myself I had a very similar experience in some ways that, that you went through where I went through a period where I was very, very stressed and was dealing with a lot of health issues, and, and I was at a point where I – Really, I it would take me like two or three hours to get out of bed in the morning because I couldn't see mm -hmm. the foot of my bed. I couldn't stand up on my legs because I couldn't feel them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, severe things going on. 
So, yeah, definitely this has such a huge, huge impact, and your story tremendously resonates with me. And I know for myself that diet has made a huge difference in how I feel and how my body responds and what I can do or not do. Wow. Well, kudos to you for doing that too, Jesse, because it, it does make such a difference. And and I did. I had to take that time. Matter of fact, I I moved. <laughs> I moved. Oh. Totally simplified my life and and um, just said that's it. I'm going to focus on healing me. And, right. And well, we don't sorry. want to and get you, to you the raised, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hence the phone conversation. Um, you raised a really good point though, where you said. Um, you know, everything now that we're feeding our kids is coming from a box and it is going into the microwave. And and that's one of the things I, I work, my demographic is largely mothers and very stressed out mothers. But we've we've become so removed from our food and so so disconnected from from its origins um, that really it, it's almost um is if we've become disconnected with each other too, and food prep now is more just a means to an end instead of a process of love like it used to be, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a gift to ourselves and to those we were cooking for. Now it's just you know how fast can I get this finished? And and I do understand as as a mother myself with a very busy schedule that you know you, we do have our limits as far as how long we can spend in the kitchen. Um, so my goal is to really work with mothers and um, help them to understand that you can still do this. You can still be in the kitchen. You can still make dinners with whole foods and not take a lot of time to do it. Well, and this is such an interesting point because when we look at it, um, we go to the store, we pick up food. It takes as much time and as energy to pick up something healthy as it does to go pull a can off the shelf. And realistically, a lot of healthy options i found are are just as easy, if not simpler, to fix. Um, I I like where you're bringing up those emotions that are going on, particularly with mothers, and they're stressed out, and they're tired, and they're worn down, and then they've got the kids to deal with, and (laughs) they have all these things going on. And... um, one of the things that, that I've looked at in energy work with people and and in, in learning to be compassionate with people as well is that those emotions that we're thinking and we're feeling goes into our food when we're preparing it. So if you have processed food and then you've got this angry and negative emotion and, and you're putting that into it while you're processing it, it's very likely that you're going to have indigestion or it's not going to settle right in your body. On the other hand, if you're fixing a meal and you're, th- and you're in, for example, gratitude, or I love that I have this beautiful meal that I fix, I, I love that I can offer my family something healthy and not have it be any more time or energy than doing microwave things. Right. And oh, absolutely. And And we find that our food digests better, that somebody becomes more receptive, that people, again, they're raising their vibrations. It's helping your family or or yourself uh, raise your vibrations up and, and get to where your body can actually take advantage and use the nutrients of the food. So true, so true. When you think about it, if, when we're cooking with whole foods, I mean, those foods have energy. They have life in them. When you're cooking something from a box, there is, there's no energy in that anymore. It's been processed and heated and ground and, and everything else. Um, there is no life within that box anymore. So you do, you absolutely want to focus on those foods that are going to provide life to you and energy to you. And, and that is what it's all about. That's a great point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, One of the... Um, um, Go ahead. I was going one of the first components um m- my job is kind of multifaceted. I do some of the work that uh, Mary Beth was talking about. One of my first components though that I work on is around the education of food because I think 
we've gotten to a point where we are so busy and we are so stressed that we tend to just grab things off the shelf. I know for me, for many years, it was all about what was on sale. You know, you got those flyers on Sunday, you went through the flyers, you clipped out the coupons, and it was what was on sale, and that's what you got. Um, And it's very easy to fall into that trap. So one of my jobs is to begin to educate mothers, and and I do that in various ways. I... I, um, if I'm working with a client, I go into their homes. I also have ladies wellness nights and I, I bring products and we talk about it. And, you know, there are various ingredients that are within our processed foods now that many people are unaware of them even being there or of what they are. Um, like, for example, high fructose corn syrup. We hear a lot of that. We know that it's not great for us. But what a lot of people don't understand is that um, one of the evils, I guess you can say, of high fructose corn syrup is that it turns off our satiety signals. So we never actually feel full. Most of the times we're very busy and not listening to our body signals anyway, and that is something else that I work on with my clients. But um, again, the high fructose corn syrup turns off those hormones altogether, so we never actually get that signal. We never actually get that message telling us that we're full and so we continue eating. So so that's why it's easy to sit down and like eat a whole pie. <laughs> exactly, yeah, a whole pie or a whole, you know, three whole packages of candy. ding, ding dongs. Or <laughs> Absolutely. It's it is interesting how those those different things process in in our bodies and and I did notice I think you're if I'm correct the events that that you hold are called um, Bow for the Ladies and Bow for the Nannies, Mm -hmm. being uh, better off well. I'm guessing that that's what that stands for? That's correct, yes. I I thought it was just clever to bow for the ladies. (laughs) That's Um, That's, There's probably a few men out there going, what about a bow for me? (laughs) I know, I know, I know. know. We can do a bow for the men too. Um, (laughs) But definitely the women have been more receptive to it at this point. I just had one last night too. And again, they're just so much fun. We get a group together. Last night it was a dozen women um, and we're all in the same room. and, And usually it's in the kitchen because that's where the energy is, right? That's where we tend to socialize anyway. Um, and I bring in food samples, and from those samples, I talk about you know various topics, um, raw foods and greens and and how we get our calcium from greens. you know we've been led to believe in this country that dairy is the number one source of calcium, where really it's it's greens and nuts and seeds that are far better source of calcium because they also include magnesium and selenium and those minerals that help with the absorption of calcium. But again, that's not a message that we get in mainstream media because our media is very um, very money-driven, unfortunately. So mm-hmm. yes, those nights are a lot of fun. I, I They're so great, and, and I'm always so energized at the end of the night when women are leaving and they say, thank you, thank you so much, I'm ready to go home and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it's so exciting. I I can imagine. it's It's got to be a lot of fun. Um, I want to give some people an idea of some of the, the recipes that you you have on your website and, uh, uh, and uh, some of the ones that I saw on there when I last looked was she's got uh, vegetarian basil chili with kale, which – just looked delicious on the picture, mm. I have to say. Um, yeah. Raw blueberry peach crisp, gluten-free yeah. and decadent blonde brownies. Okay, I could not tell the difference by looking at these things. I was thinking, man, those are just looking as good as any regular thing I'd see. <laughs> and, and one thing that I saw that was interesting and a little bit different was you had spirulina power bars. So it's like a lot of times we go on and I'm seeing these pictures and people are making them look as decadent and and yummy as, you know, regular um, whatever types of food, meat foods or whatever you want to say, non-raw diet. Mm -hmm. But then it's rare that you see a recipe for doing like your own power bars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know, and and again, the cool thing, or what I really try to do, is is try to show moms that you can do this in a fairly, you know, it's it's easy. They're usually, I usually don't have any more than five ingredients. 
a lot of times everything just goes into a food processor. With the spirulina bars, I think everything just goes right into the baking pan. Super, super easy, um, ready within a half hour usually. And, yeah, if you go to the store and you're you're looking for a power bar, unless you're in a health food store where they definitely have some healthier alternatives, most of those power bars are, are nothing more than glorified candy bars. There's tons of sugar in them, and um, they're not going to do much for your body. So, again, yes, I try to, to show moms that you can make these pretty easily, and you can get your kids to help you, too. And, they you know, they love to do that stuff, and, and this stuff actually tastes good good <laughs> and is really you know fuels your body and and taste is such a big thing because i think for so long people were used to um <laughs> you know that health food did not taste good and there was no way to make it taste good <laughs> and i i know for myself from having to go gluten free um many years ago that I learned the substitutes, and and like you say, there's so many hidden things there. I I love when I go someplace and they say, well, it's gluten-free, but then Mm. we'll have something like maltodextrin, soy, (laughs) and and a few other things that don't work with people who need to be seriously gluten-free. Right, and that's a great point. And it's we have something in common because I had a weed allergy. I was diagnosed with a weed allergy growing up, and I think at that time they called it a weed allergy because they didn't understand that it was actually gluten. But, yes, we've come a long way <laughs> since then, since the caraway seed bread and the puffed rice cereal for breakfast. <laughs> um, but, yes, and I do make a point, too. I, I still do gluten-free myself because I've definitely noticed when I – have gluten that makes a difference in me. I start to feel lethargic. Um, it can totally affect my mood. So I definitely stay away from gluten. But I make it a point to let women know that if you're trying a gluten-free diet, you don't just want to go out and buy you know, gluten-free pretzels and gluten-free cookies and gluten-free breads because those foods, first of all, are, are nutrient deficient. Once you take out the gluten, which is a protein, you're taking out a lot of your B vitamins. Um, The other thing is a lot of those gluten-free cookies and whatnot still have lots of sugars in them and lots of other products, as you pointed out, that are Mm -hmm. not good for our bodies. So instead I show women, you know, instead of having the bread, you you can create a lettuce wrap. So, for example, last night I brought my recipe. It's a a spread just made with cauliflower, cashews, nutritional yeast, and a little sea salt. Blend it in the blender with a little water and then wrapped in a lettuce, in a piece of lettuce. And it was so good, and and all the women loved it. But how simple was that? And you're not using any gluten, and you're not um, using something that's gluten-free and nutrient-deficient either. And talk with us a little bit about how some of these different foods affect our emotions. Oh, yes, definitely. Um so gluten, first of all, as I said, when I take in gluten, when I take in, I try to avoid it altogether. Occasionally I'll have it here and there, but I definitely notice it will affect my mood. Um, my energy levels will drop. I, I can become depressed if I have too much of it. And a lot of us are walking around with this, with these low energy levels and this depression and this brain fog and not realizing that the food we're taking into our bodies could very much be responsible for at least part of that. Um, farming is still relatively new in our evolutionary history. It's only about 10,000 years old. So the whole idea of grains is still fairly new to our bodies We're also eating grains that are far different than what they were when we first started farming. When we first were farming, grains were often cut in the fields and they were stored in the fields where they were rained on so they were sprouted. So that's how we consumed our grains. They were sprouted and more easily digested. Uh, The grains today, of course, everything is done indoors. Many of our grains are actually bred to have a higher gluten content so that they have a longer shelf life. And gluten is... in all kinds of places. I mean, it can be found in in condiments and, um, you know, in addition to breads, it's it's just everywhere. I'm trying to think right offhand. I know there's, um, I I think I found it. um, 
is, is one of the culprits. Maltodextrin is a big culprit. Wheat. Um, Maltodextrin is a corn product, actually, actually, but that is, um, but that's another issue because then you're getting into genetically modified foods, and that's something else that I try to educate people around as well. But, um, but, get, but, I mean, body products contain gluten now too, so we're getting so much exposure to gluten now that uh, many of us again are walking around with these low energy levels and this brain fog, and not realizing that if we reduced our gluten content, it might actually make a difference. So I, that's one thing that I always suggest to people to try, too, if if they are feeling these low energy levels. Either go completely cold turkey for three weeks or reduce your gluten content and see if you notice a difference that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there there are a lot of changes, and, and it's true because I I know for myself, you know, for a while you could I could do corn or I could do rice, and then... Now it's like there's so much that's genetically modified that mm. we really have to be careful with that and 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 it's different for everybody. I mean, what works as far as gluten-free for one person, some people need it much more extreme mm-hmm. than other and some things are very borderline and and some of it really is just about resetting the the whole digestive system and giving the the body the time to heal itself. Um, That's right. And come back in, and and I know for me, a lot of times when I'm, when I start clearing my body and I'm doing some of these other things, I, I simply just don't crave a lot of the sweets and things like mm-hmm. that. And my mm-hmm. about, when my body gets to a point where it's really detoxified out to a certain extent, I just don't crave it. Right. Oh, and that's such a great point, too. I mean, once I started really taking care of myself and doing my green smoothies every day, over the course of time, I found that the foods that I once loved and was hooked on and craved, I no longer wanted anymore, as you said. And it's such a beautiful thing. I I remember around the holidays um, going into a box of Russell Stover candies because it was there and um, trying one of the candies and it tasted like cardboard. It was flavorless. It didn't, I didn't want it anymore. I didn't even finish it. Um, So I absolutely agree that once you get beyond a certain point, you do start to miss those foods less and less. And I just wanted to go back really quickly because you you raised a very important point about gluten too. There are some people who actually have celiac disease, and, and again, there might be many people who are unaware that they may have this. And what I do is encourage people to really to keep a food journal. If if people's energy levels are very low, uh, if moods are a real issue, up and down, up and down, definitely keep a food journal and, and see when those moods and when those energy levels definitely change. And, uh, you know, go to see a doctor and go to have yourself tested for celiac disease because if you do have celiac disease, that's a more serious issue. That that means that the, um, the villi that lines your intestine uh, atrophies when it, the more it's exposed to gluten. And once it atrophies, it can't absorb the nutrients from your food. So that's a real issue. So definitely if somebody is experiencing, you know, the the consistent brain fog, lack of energy, then I would say to go get tested and and at least rule that out. It doesn't mean that you don't have a gluten sensitivity because the allergy test won't pick that up, but it but it will at least rule out celiac disease. Mhm. Yeah, and and these are important things to be aware of uh, of mm-hmm. with things. And there are like we say oftentimes the more processed food is the more sugars that are in foods the more we're going to get that drain feeling and that that brain fog feeling and um and that's where some of these alternatives like Donna has created come in so that you don't have to feel deprived right off you don't have to feel like oh all i can eat is weeds <laughs> you know? right um there are so many delicious foods out there and so many delicious seasonings and i think i think our herbs and our seasonings are something that we need to get back to as a mm-hmm. as a society and a culture because that's where a lot of the the actual flavor comes from and mm-hmm. and as you start to detoxify things from your body um your your taste buds 
you'll, you'll find that you'll actually taste the food more. And oh, then, my goodness. Another great point, and that's so true. I, you know, I, again, years ago I was covering all of my food in cheese and cream, and <laughs> you're right, everything was just bland, bland. I mean, it was it was maybe delicious to me at the time, but I never knew what flavors were until you know, a few years ago when I started cleaning up my diet. Now, yes, I can, I can, I'm on taste sensory overload. Sometimes <laughs> I, I can sense taste like I never did before, and I enjoy food like I never did before. So that's such a great point. And not only do you get so much flavor from those herbs, but you get a lot of nutrition. Turmeric is one of the world's healthiest foods, believe it or not. Um, cinnamon. Cinnamon has a lot of nutrient benefits to it. So, yes, all of those herbs are great to get into your food. Parsley, three times the amount of vitamin C as an orange. I mean, who knew? You always just put that off the side of your plate when it comes, when it comes on top of your food at a restaurant. And your but, greens um, have so much iron in them, yeah. and, and it's way above what you can get from, like, a liquid supplement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well. And and people think about that. They think, well, I'll just take a supplement. Because I know I, I fell into that phase for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Let me just take a pill. Let me just take a supplement. And we don't mm-hmm. realize how much genetically modified stuff and other stuff is put into a lot of those. All right. So true. And a lot of those vitamins, if people are taking multivitamins or whatnot, are synthetic versions, which are not typically uh, absorbed as well by our bodies as a food-based mm-hmm. vitamin is. Um, so, yes, that's a great point. And you mentioned also, too, that living a healthy lifestyle is not about denial. It's not about sacrifice. And that's a point that I bring up often. And uh, um, another way that I tell people to approach this is if you are at a party and you do see a brownie or a piece of cake and you want that piece of cake, don't deny yourself. Go ahead, put that cake on the plate Sit down with it. Preferably, do not talk with anybody at the moment. You know, which is a little difficult at a party. I understand, but try to as much as possible focus on that dessert and really taste it. You know, when you put that piece of cake into your mouth, taste it, feel it on your tongue, let it roll around, enjoy it, um, and take your time with it. Because so often today, we, that's the other thing that we do, is we're not mindful eaters anymore. And we we um, inhale everything without chewing it completely. And what that <laughs> does is it, it means we tend to overeat because, first of all, our brains, we're usually multitasking. Our brains don't even register that we're eating. Uh, because we're taking in such large bites, our bodies can only break it down so much. So we're not absorbing all the nutrients, we're not breaking down all the cell walls in that food. We're not absorbing all the nutrients. So even though we've gotten the calories from the food, we've not gotten all the nutrients. So our bodies will still feel hungry. So it is important to be mindful eaters too, whether it's with that dessert or whether it's with any of our meals. And, and research has found too that we get the most pleasure from the two and three bites of our mm-hmm. desserts. So if we're really being mindful and paying attention to those signals, it's possible that we, you know, we'll be able to stop halfway through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Taking taking that time is just huge. I mean, I I know people, especially in my past, that it, it's like they just inhale the food. You know, one second it was on the plate, and the next second the plate was clean. <laughs> <laughs> was and like, we don't know what happened to it. Where right? did it go? Did somebody eat it? <laughs> I I mean, did you have like three people help you there? <laughs> but it's yeah, so and true. and it, it, we miss that and and energetically we need that passion of enjoying our food. We need we need to be able to really take it in and 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 indulge in it. I mean, that's part of that that switch philosophy. It's not really about deprivation, it's about indulging in it. It's a, indulging in the meal, indulging in um Caring for yourself, being compassionate with yourself, uh, exactly. these different things. Um, yes, yes. Talk to us I'm, kind of quickly <laughs> here yeah, about um, what you're going to cover in the weekend that we're doing together with Mary Beth and provide us ways that people can reach you and contact you if they would like to 
talk with you more and find out more about what you're doing. Sure. Uh, well, what I would love to do and what I plan to do during our workshop, and I'm so excited to be working together, is, again, first of all, to address that educational component of food, uh, the ingredients that are in it, various recipes that you can make at your home that are very simple to do. The other component that I work on with my clients, of course, is that emotions part that we talked a little bit about. Um, We're all emotional eaters, and that's a very necessary element to address when we're working on our own health journey. The first step, of course, is to recognize that you are feeling an emotion, and that's what's causing you to have this craving. And what is causing this feeling? Is it stress? Is it um, perfectionism? Is it shame? Which we all have an element of to uh, to some extent. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the education around the food. We're going to talk about emotions and cravings and what those are and how to deal with them. We're going to talk about gratitude and affirmations and how to show self-compassion through those elements as well. And... um, how people can get in touch with me. I have a website, as you had mentioned, www.betteroffwell.com. And I'm also on Facebook. I have a business page on Facebook at Better Off Well. And people really like to go there because I offer wellness tips and bits and pieces. So sometimes that can seem far less overwhelming. And I'm big into baby steps. I I like to support people in their health journey through baby steps because we all have to go at it at our own pace or it can seem too overwhelming. Absolutely, and that's one of my big keys. Break it down, make it small, make it simple. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's how we get there a lot of times. That's right. And it doesn't feel painful that way. <laughs> it's right, exactly. It's not painful, and it's not about denial or sacrifice that way. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Donna, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight after you've been going all day long and doing things <laughs> or jumping on the air with us. Um, and I do have, uh, let's see here, a caller with a question <clears throat> on the air here, so I'm going to get to them real quickly, and uh, we're going to need to make this quick caller, because I do have somebody in chat I've got to address as well for myself. Okay. Okay. I've got somebody on that's 703 area code. Hello, Jesse. It's me, Daniel Michael. Hey, Daniel. Hello, and how are you this evening? I I love your guests this evening, uh, both (laughs) of them, actually. And I just wanted to mention a, a few things briefly that The lettuce wrap thing, I actually have done that before. (laughs) I thought of that one before myself, and it's a great idea. And actually, if you had somebody to address first, I say go ahead and address them. Okay. Um, Yeah, it was uh, somebody that I have in chat here, and they were actually asking a a compassion question um, where they've been dealing with – people that have been very aggressively negative towards them and they were wondering how to be compassionate with people who are are for example invading their house um and and working a lot of negative things uh towards their life and um doing things without their consent uh, mm-hmm. I won't get into heavy details on this mm-hmm. but um because of the nature the nature of it but when we have people like that in our life, we really need to look at a couple of things, and that is looking at, um, first of all, it's up to us to keep our boundaries set. Second of all, those people rely on us being in that negative thought pattern and that negative form. And so we have to um, continue to find ways. People cannot work, for example, dark magic on you um, as Mary Beth was mentioning earlier, without some sort of consent um, and and things there. And even, even if they were to do something, um, if we have ourselves staying in a positive frame of mind, then then we can overcome that. And those things will, we will actually be immune to those sorts of things coming at us. Uh, so that, that would be what I would say there. And realizing that when we come from that more evolved space, that it's not about 
what they're doing to us, it's actually they're they're hurting themselves. They're in a place of pain. They're in a place of trying to be in power and control, and they're doing that because they are actually operating from a space that lacks power and lacks control. So um, uh, talks about righteousness. Um, that was your question there. And, and you can get past this. You absolutely can. And if you actually bombard their sphere with positive energy, they'll actually stop bothering you. You have to really bombard it with their energy and just constantly constantly go to them and say, you know what, I, I send you love to get through whatever you're dealing with. And and that will work you out of it. Okay, I got an okay, thanks. Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> okay, yes, I certainly didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> your show. I, uh, I really um, became interested because I've been thinking about the gluten thing a lot recently and I've worked in the food industry a lot and I've thought about in the past – I'm 41 now. Back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, when I worked in restaurants, and no one ever talked about gluten allergy and such. And of course, now I've worked in a grocery store uh, to supplement income, and it's a constant thing. Anytime somebody demos food, you know, there's got to be a sign out there that says, you know, that this food contains gluten. And it's become a very big thing. I actually think it's in part, uh, well, we won't drag this out too long, uh, based on the dwarf wheat and the GMOs, the genetically modified mm-hmm. food, and as well as other things. I think there's a natural condition that also maybe existed but was created and made much worse with the GMOs uh, mm-hmm. coming about in the in the 90s and becoming much more prevalent. Mm-hmm. And another guest we had on our show on Main Street Universe, the flagship show, and and by the way, welcome again, Jesse. I, I love having you aboard <laughs> and coming home late <laughs> from work. I like <laughs> tuning in and hearing you on the air on Friday night. <laughs> and uh, our guest for he wrote a vegan pizza cookbook, and his name was. Mark Sutton and his book was Heart Healthy Pizza. Now, it wasn't gluten-free. Um, he may have come up with one of his doughs that was gluten-free. I thought maybe there might have been one, but it was totally vegan. No cheese, no soy cheese, nothing like that. It was all an interesting combination of these heavy, well, that are meant to have that heavy texture of cheese. He called them sauces. But a very interesting book, and he was recently, after he, we were his first interview, his second one, was on slightly more big time radio. A guy named Dr. Don Wagner just the other day he saw me and said he was very happy that he got to use Main Street Universe uh, as his first radio interview, and then he went on to to be interviewed by this gentleman in Arizona, Dr. Don Wagner. Maybe I'll post it in the chat room or maybe on the Facebook page for Main Street Universe, perhaps. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that and I also wanted to mention a point when your guest mentioned tasting something that she had gotten over and then it just didn't taste right to her or that it was the candy I believe she mentioned. Mm-hmm. And that happened to me when I stopped eating fast food <clears throat> and such and I decided one day out of a whim to have a fast food burger and it literally tasted like a combination of plastic and salt. That's what I remember. <laughs> like when I ate it. It was sort of a salty plastic. <laughs> and uh, it was a very strange taste. It was completely unpleasant. And I was like, I used to eat like this all the time. Yeah. I'm still not perfect. I do, you know, but I pretty much try to eat, you know, real food now. But, you know, every once in a while I slip like anybody else. But it really tasted horrible. And it felt like it weighed about 50 pounds when it was in my <laughs> stomach. <laughs> oh, gosh. Am I... That you raised some great points. Am I still on, Jesse? Oh, oh yeah. yep, on. Okay. Um, yeah. I, first of all, I can't wait to check out that cookbook. Um, I did find for me, dairy was the the cause or one of the causes of my asthma. So I have eliminated that from my life. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. And I absolutely agree with your point about the gluten and and the food allergies in general because since genetically modified foods have been introduced into our system, we've seen such an increase in food allergies, and that could be the topic for a whole other show, of course. Um, and then, yes, the the food thing, you are so right. I, food 
is so different, and, and you don't have to be perfect. Remember that. It's not about perfectionism, but it's about growth, and, and it's so true, though. Once you taste real food, you just never want to go back. <laughs> true. And I'll post that link to his cookbook, and it, it'll have his site and his interview with both us and Dr. Wagner on site um, in Arizona. He's, I think he's a nationally broadcasted guy. So I'll I'll post that in the chat room, I think, in a second, and I'll go ahead and let you two finish out and have a good night. All right, All right thank thanks, you. Daniel. Thank you for your input. All right, and thank you, and keep up the good work, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Daniel. Bye. Okay, Bye. thanks. Okay, and so I'm just going to wrap up with a few things here. Um I just feel so blessed to be working with Donna and Mary Beth both as part of my Compassion Tour. Um, again, this is going to be an amazing weekend. The stop on the tours in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Um, at the moment, this is the only full weekend event on my tour. I do have a couple that have um, two weekend days to it, but this one actually starts on Friday night and then is all day on a Saturday and Sunday. It's October 12th through 14th, um, and, and this, this intensity level is amazing. Uh, during this event, we'll not only be working with things from my book, but as you heard from Mary Beth and Donna, the things that they're going to be working on. Um, again, Donna's going to be preparing food at this workshop. We'll be learning how to activate a compassionate lifestyle, bring a greater awareness of ways to create the life that works for you, increase your energy and ability to enjoy life, open doors to the reality you want, discover how hypnosis empowers you, explore distorted beliefs and judgments, learn how to create stronger health and wellness for yourself. Um, again, bonuses on this. People are going to receive one copy of each of my books as well as one full month of free email coaching. That's a $4,500 value right there uh, plus. So it's a huge bonus. Again, I, I can't say that I'm going to be able to offer these on the 2013 tour, but uh, definitely you're going to be able to take advantage of getting them here and now if you sign up. The the link to register for that event is compassiontouratleboro.eventbrite.com. And um, that that's amazing. The, the full weekend events are so valuable because of the intensity of how we delve into things, and it, it really is an opportunity to break out of those blocks and barriers and create some strong, intense transformations going on in your life. Now, if you'd like to check out all of the events that are available to register for, again, you can go to www.jessianicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. I've got tour on the tour stops coming up at Chichester, New Hampshire, by the way, you have a very short time to register for that. Um, even though it starts on the 9th, you really need to be registered by, say, the, the end of this week, by next Friday. So within one week to register for that. North Attleboro is coming up in only like two weeks, um, just outside of Boston. Babylon, New York. I've just added a stop for Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, just west of Philadelphia. Um, that, that's going to be a really great event there. Glen Echo, Maryland, just outside of D.C. Um, I've also just added another fundraising event for Hopeful Hooves, which is uh, occurring in Arizona, the Phoenix Valley area. Um, the Hopeful Hooves is actually located in Buckeye, but we will be doing the event in Scottsdale, Arizona. We've actually had a very nice space provided for us there um, by the D.C. Village Health Club and Spa. They've given us a space to, to work out of there. And then I'm still finalizing um, Evansville, Indiana, what's going on with that. So make sure you get your seats. We're running out of time for you to sign up on those. And um, if you'd like to find out more about the work I'm doing with Compassion, you can connect with me at uh, facebook.com forward slash activating compassion. You can also check out my blog at getyourblisson.tumblr.com, and my website is bliss.freetzi, that's F-R-E-E-T-Z-I.com. All of this information is actually right at the bottom of today's show description, and if you're interested in the books that I've put out, Activating Compassion and Activating Compassion, the workbook, 
Those are at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com for the paperback, and you can get them um, through Smashwords as an ebook. Don't forget that as a live listener, if you'd like to take advantage of the coaching that I offer, um, that is available at I'm doing 90% off of the un, of the unlimited email coaching and 75% off the quantum energy work. So you just need to contact me at Life of uh, bliss at q.com and let me know you want to take advantage of that and I can help you uh, know how to go forward with that. Next week, I will be having guests Patricia Finley and Kathleen Ravel, both also certified health, holistic health coaches with even a little different approach than what Donna was giving tonight. They are the owners of Eat, Hill Live in Babylon, New York. They also provide classes and workshops at a low cost to the community. Don't forget here on Main Street Universe that we have shows throughout the week. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time is Daniel, Janice, and Brett. They look at the tarot. Um, If you didn't catch their last show on Wednesday, you might want to check out the archives. It's all about beer. And um, Thursdays at 11 a.m. is Eastern Time is Evan with the Zariana Show. Friday evenings, late afternoons. Uh, Kevin Baird walking on the wild side with his Horizon Oracle journey. So this is Jesse and Nichols George. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you back here next week as we delve more into activating compassion. Don't forget that if you have enjoyed this show, to share it with others. It will be available at the same link in our archives. I'm going to leave you tonight with the song Yearning For, also called Over and Over by Shem Shai. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an amazing week. And I apologize for some reason. Sound is not working on here, so... For whatever reason, our song does not want to come on tonight. (laughs) But that's okay. Anyways, if you have any questions, I will be around in chat for a couple of minutes. And um, I appreciate everybody being here. And again, look forward to seeing you next week on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour.